What up? What's good? It's your boy BQ Impact Lounge, number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. Here is your Impact Wrestling review for the week. I'm happy to be having the time to do this Sunday morning and not do it too late in the week. So last episode, I talked about uh, the new, uh, I should have it on the graphic here, but I don't. Um, the new BQ Patreon that's come out, patreon.com backslash BQ Speaks. It is free for the month of March. Any podcast or, or review is going to be on that platform in a streaming um, in a stream platform. I don't mean to use the word platform twice like that. I can think of what else to say. Um, streaming format, I guess, is what I should say. Um, but there's also lots of other content on there right now. So I've reviewed the Jordan Grace Diary episode. Uh, I talked about the first episode of Ring of Honor. I uh, talked about... Um, my thoughts of Mandy Leon ended up ending up in MLW when I think Impact should have uh, should have grabbed her. Uh, thoughts on Taya Valkyrie exiting the company. Could we see Brian Cage in the company? Um, my TNA. Um, I'm I'm getting ready to do TNA replay, which is uh, reviewing Pop TV episodes, uh, re-reviewing them after uh you know after so long has passed when I reviewed them the first time around. And then uh, there's also an episode of Total Nonstop Reaction on there where I'm, uh, you know, once a month going to be looking at a Destination America episode that I've never seen before and reacting to it and comparing it to uh, same with the pop TV era stuff, but comparing it to impact today and what, what they do and what they got going on, the goods, the bads, all that good stuff from just the cameras to the wrestling to the stories, the promos, the commentary, everything we're going to we're going to be comparing those things so there's quite a bit of content up there right now for you to check out and again it's free for the month of march and if for those of you who don't like uh listening to your podcast on youtube you know that's a way to do it ad free to stream um the impact reviews since i'm no longer on normal streaming platforms all right so let's get into this um took a couple minutes of your time much better than i did last week talking about it for like 10 minutes let's get into it uh impact uh, this wasn't good. So we had some good episodes in January, some in February, and then we had that God awful episode, God awful. And then we bounced back with a decent episode. Now another, another bad episode. And this wasn't, this wasn't two weeks ago's episode. Like that one should just never be spoken of again. Uh, but it wasn't as good as last week's. It was it was it was like in the middle of the two. There were some redeeming qualities about this one. That was the difference between the one two weeks ago, where there's, there was just nothing good about it except for uh, Rich Swan's backstage stuff. Uh, this 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 had some good things, but this this overall was not good. Um, usually they don't start off the year like this. Usually it's usually I'm sitting here in like October or November, and be like, man, this episode wasn't good. Usually in January, February, March, like it's just like firing on all cylinders, you know. That is not what they're doing right now. It's it's, it's just not. So we're gonna break it down. I'm not gonna be like overly negative because again, this wasn't all bad, but there was enough bad on it that it was, you know, overall a, a bad episode. So one thing I kind of forgot to mention last week is that the camera is back on the entrance ramp. And I've had a lot of conversations with fans and, and people who've been at the venues and all that saying, you know, well, it's it's just the setup. They can't they can't position a hard camera on the fans because of the bleachers and how they're positioned and all that. I'm pretty sure MLW did this. You know, some of these have done some of these same venues and have shown the crowd. So I I'm not an expert on that. All I know is that it doesn't look good, and 100% of the fans don't like it. That's that's all I know. Um, But it really changes the viewing experience, because again, like you could see when the camera was panning, there's a lot of people there. There, There's a lot, like uh, so much more than what we're used to seeing, and we're just not getting that and not getting a chance to enjoy it. You know, and like I always point out, if people know they're going to kind of be on camera, like they're going to be part of the show. You know, we kick it off with Bully Ray. So they're they're doing, you know, I've been saying this every week. They're getting better about let's kick it off with a, a recognizable face, recognizable name, recognizable logo, 
We don't have to play Wii on the night. They're doing a pretty good job with this. Uh, Bully Ray comes out. And we're very there's very mixed reactions on Bullet Ray within the Impact Wrestling fan base. Did I say Bullet Ray? I was thinking Bullet Club in my head. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. Bully Ray, Bobby Ray, Buddy Ray. He comes down, and I'm one of the people. I'm enjoying him. I didn't think that I would. I really didn't think I would. I thought there was no no way in hell I was going to enjoy uh, join me some Bully Ray. But um, I thought he I thought he's done very well with the promos. He can still really talk. He can get people into it. And one thing I noticed with this episode too that they're doing. Uh, a very good job on. I shouldn't say a very good job because they're doing a better job is getting reaction footage from the crowd rather than putting a camera in front of their face. So they're looking directly in the camera and going boo and looking goofy and stupid. Like they're, they're getting, um, they're getting angles where you're just getting genuine reactions from people. And that's that's really what we want. Like that's gonna feel more more authentic. And they did it a little bit, you know, put a camera in someone's face. They show a lot of old people, which I, I don't understand that that thinking because that we're trying to create a, a product for eighteen to, you know, I, I, sh- I shouldn't even say that demographic. Like we want to start creating a product that people in their early to mid twenties are are into. I think that's that, that's where they got to start focusing. The eighteen to forty nine that that's very broad. Like, I, I really think those those mid, maybe mid twenties. I, I think we got to start being cool to that audience. Um, you know, so so we'll see. That hasn't been the case so far. He said something to a lady there about uh, I'm going to take your sister home with me or something. Like he's so good on the fly, it's not forced. I mean, so. Even though like last week's Bullet Club promo, Bullet Club promo, I thought was a little long, because uh, you know they can talk for a little bit, but after a while it's like okay, shut up. Like Bully Ray, I could listen to him him talk for a while, um, and then you know they were showing like when he threw the coffee at Tommy Dreamer, and I talked about this doing I think when I was doing the review of the of that show, is that. So we have multiple food fight angles on the show right now. I I think the coffee one would have had more impact if they didn't do that silly chili one. And these are both coffee and chili are both hot, right? Well, Dreamer reacts like it's hot. Giselle reacts like I just had a bowl of cold chili thrown on me. Like why is someone eating cold chili? Um, But we're doing multiple food and beverage angles. Uh, and that has to like stop immediately. They're going to do a busted open match. I I, I called this and I, I, I don't even want to take the credit because I almost want to say I heard um, Mike and JD say it on, on Brace for Impact. We're probably going to get a busted open match. I feel like I heard them say it first and I probably just repeated it. But a busted open match. And it's going to be a hardcore, no rules, old school rules match. Like it's what spin on it can they put is... Dave LaGreca going to be the referee? Is he going to be the special timekeeper? Is he going to... uh, I don't know. Be in someone's corner? Maybe. I don't know. Um, I'm not looking forward to that because I I said it's okay to bring in some of these old guys because nostalgia is not a horrible idea. Don't fucking have them wrestle each other. There's, I, I just... I don't really see the money in that, but whatever. They are going to wrestle each other. But I do think Bully Ray, whenever he has these segments, I think he he makes it work. And he's saying, you know, Tommy Dreamers is just an empty challenge. There's not going to be no busted open match. Yes, there is. Spoiler alert. Yes, there is. There is going to be a busted open match. It's probably going to be a sacrifice. Um, There's probably going to be some bleeding involved, you know. Maybe I, I wouldn't be surprised if the match doesn't deliver. I think it'll, you know, ultimately be good. But we've just seen so much of this kind of of shit on the show, you know, so we'll see. Maybe they, um, prove us wrong. Santino comes out and talked about burning his balls and eyeballs. Santino's humor, even though I, I'd love it. 
I, I don't think it's hitting right now. I think he's a little like rusty with the audience because just the way he delivered that, it's almost like he corrected himself before the audience knew what he said. You know, before they got to to drink in and a little soak it in that he has said he said burn your balls. Then of all people, Boopy comes out. And I was like, oh God, no. I thought he was going to grab the microphone and talk. And I was like, this is going to get this is gonna go south very quickly. But he comes out and he says, I'm gonna do this in my my native language. And I thought he said that very clearly too. I thought I thought he was very well spoken when he did that. And they did it in the native language. And then Santino like translated and, and it worked. I, I thought it actually worked. You know, at first I, I I thought there was a train wreck coming and Bully Ray's face of being like disgusted during this was great. That was, I thought that was absolutely classic. There's People could really learn from, from Bully Ray though. I, I, I will say that much. It would have been interesting to see uh, cause he, he, you know, if you guys don't know, he was going to come back to the company at one point, uh, and then ended up didn't, and they brought in Alberto El Patron instead. So that El Patron storyline was kind of that he did. He came in, won the title night one, all that bullshit, Bobby Lashley, that, that was supposed to be Bully Ray. And, um, I think what, what Bully Ray had said was that he was given, Instead of having his own story written out, he was given Drew Galloway's story. And he didn't want to do that. So I don't know if Galloway was the one that was supposed to beat Lashley and all that shit. I, I don't really know. I know Galloway was doing the digital the digital media, the, the grand championship stuff at the time when he got hurt. So I don't really know. Um, and then, you know, they made a match for right now. Uh, we didn't talk about uh, before the impact. Probably because... It's horrible, but no, they had they had a decent match of Ross Shearer and, and or excuse me, Ross Sting and Shearer against Swan and Kazarian. And you know, I kind of like the matches. because it's weird. I, I like Jim Miller on commentary more than uh, Matt Raywall for some reason. I just, I just, I don't know. She does a pretty good job. Like I could see her being very good at it one day, and Impact like really bring her in the booth full time because I think she, I think she, you know, does a pretty good job. But anytime Rich Swan wrestles, I'm gonna watch. And for the life of me, I don't know why they don't come out to Raj Singh's music instead of Shira's because Raj Singh's music is fire. But this match was just, you know, it was it was before the impact. I think this this before the impact would be better if they had if they started making it like they're they're dark, their AEW dark, and put like three matches on there. You know, get let Jackson Stone get a match or or, or one of these dudes because I think the impact audiences now are big enough to do that so my experience is i went to a show in orlando one time and they had the main event i don't i I don't remember who it was i think it actually might have been eddie winning the world title and then they were like everyone's getting ready to go home and they're just like okay we're gonna film a, a match for explosion and it was like jade versus someone and i mean half the people left and i was thinking at the time they don't have enough people here to add a whole lot of extra matches. Um, they really should have put the explosion match in the middle or before or something like that. But um, I just, you know, or for people who are like, Oh, they need a second show in this and this. I'm like, they don't have the audience for a second. They don't have the audience retention for a second show. Now, now we have paid audience uh, paid audience. So they're going to stay for the show. It's not like in Orlando people would kind of come and go. Uh, they're they're going to stay for the show, you know, so they have the opportunity now, you know, they're doing the main event Mondays um, and on the Patreon I actually reviewed main event Monday, Josh Alexander versus Moose as well. So that's, you know, again, more content on there for you to check out. Um, They're doing good about adding that to it. But now that the, now that they have the audience, they do experiment with one more match for before the impact because Nobody gives a shit about watching last week's highlights. And then they turn on the episode impact and it's the next last week's highlights again. I just don't think it's necessary. I don't think they have to do old TNA stuff. Like, you know, it's essentially a better version of explosion. So, you know, I really think uh, they should do that or even bring back Josh Matthews segment interview and someone, you know, but 
um, the, with the exclusive match being just such a small part of the show, you know, I, you know, I think you can throw another match in there and get some, you know, get someone some, some reps, you know, because when you're signing people and you're saying, Hey, we're going to come pay you, you know, 200 bucks a day. And they're like, I don't know if I want to do that, especially if I'm not on TV ever, like at least you're giving them another platform that, Hey, well, we can book you for this, you know? So yes, yes. Um, but Rich Swan and, and Frankie Kazarian obviously win. It, it's funny because on the commentary, they're like, oh, I wonder who Josh Alexander is going to pick for his tag team partners. And it's those two exact people. <laughs> anyway, um, Bully Ray Bupinder, uh, Guzier, Boopy, they had a match. And they had a match. Bully Ray wins by disqualification. And that sets up for Tommy Dreamer to come down. And it sets up for Masha to come down. And I just don't think this is the tone you want to set your your shows off with. Because what, what I've always been talking about is the bookend format works for them. When they have a great opener and a great main event. Like this episode had a great main event. I loved it. But when the first match is bullshit, that, you know, that's likely your od- largest audience of the episode. I mean, it made sense with the bully promo and all that, like it did. So it's not it's not like they can follow that format every single week. Like they gotta switch it up a little. Especially because I'm the first one to say, like, I hate when it's cut and paste and cookie cutter and it's the same, the same exact format week to week. You know, so I this is okay to do this. You kind of gotta do it. But at the same time, when they do, the episode is not as good. That's just always kind of how it um how it works out. So, you know, these guys come down and they're, of course, Tommy dreamer is going to be on this episode. Like they were acting like, Oh, he, this, this fool is not going to show up. I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can do this at the same time while I'm talking here, look up um, the viewership from this episode. Because uh, this next segment, There's no way that's correct. Oh no, I'm looking up a pop TV one. <laughs> it's like there's there is absolutely no way in hell. This next segment here, I'm gonna talk and search at the same time. If you're tuning into Impact Wrestling and you see the Bull Ray DQ match, and then you see this episode of PCO. I mean this episode, this segment of PCO, I think you shut the TV off, honestly. Um I'm pulling up these. I don't know why I'm sh- pulling up the latest on WrestleNomics and it's showing me February 23rd. Uh, we're just going to look up WrestleNomics, the website straight up instead of uh, Google. Anyway, if you turn this on, I, I don't think you're like, let me continue to watch the show. This was PCO in the desert. I, I thought this was, at first I was like, I think they recorded this after they did the first one. But when Eddie had showed up later with his green tip mohawk, I was like, okay, this they did this, you know, separate. Um, I, I don't know that they've ever had PCO talk before. And he did it, it worked. Like, don't don't get me wrong. Like he, he it absolutely worked. He um he was able to fit the gimmick with what what with what he was doing, but I I forgot what I was watching the other day. I do not remember. There was something in wrestling I was watching and I was I was saying to myself some people shouldn't speak. The gimmick uh I think I think it was Wardlow actually. I I was like oh I that's what it was. He was um he was wrestling but his his gear was stolen so he had to wrestle in like normal clothes and he actually looked better. But I was just like this dude cuz his promos suck ass. So I was kind of thinking you know, he just shouldn't speak. He should just be a badass. And and PCO came in my head. I was like, PCO's not cutting promos on Impact. And then here he is, you know, <laughs> talking. Eddie. I laugh because Eddie has done so many of those promos where he's backstage. Sammy. Sammy. You know, so it was kind of funny. But I say this from week to week. I have just absolutely no interest 
I don't know why WrestleNomics. I'm I'm looking at the current Impact ratings, and it's showing me February 23rd. I I don't know what what the hell that's about. Um, I I I say week to week. Oh, God, I want this to be over. Like this is the worst long term storyline ever. I just want it to be over like so badly. I don't know what kind of match is going to end it. No, I do. They keep bringing a shovel out. AEW just did like this buried alive type of match. Is Impact going to do the same thing? I mean, they're going to come off like they're copying them. I mean, is that is that a fair assessment? It, it's going to come off like they are like they're copying them. I can't find these uh this viewership numbers, so I'm gonna stop doing that while I'm talking. I can't imagine the viewership's fen- you know phenomenal given these two segments. That's that's just my assumption. I'm starting to come around on PCO. Don't get me wrong. I just would like to see him feud with someone else. And then Josh Alexander asks Rich Swan to be um, his partner. Kazarian comes out. I loved Steve. So I'm first before I talk about Steve Macklin, I got to give Josh Alexander some props because I thought he was going to drag this whole feud down with Macklin. And this is the second week in a row that he's almost like stepped out of his shell a little bit and just had a little more. Um, Cause Josh Alexander, this was Eddie Edwards problem when he was a world t- champion. It was wrestling one oh one promos. Same shit every week. That was Eddie's problem. And I thought that was Josh's problem for a while, but I'm starting to see, you know, him him uh carry his own a little bit better. We're seeing that improvement that we need to see in his personality so he doesn't come off like a you know a bland white meat baby face. So uh but there I, I'm not gonna lie, when this happened, I was like, I don't know who they're fighting. I thought they were fighting the bullet club, but it was time machine. And Kushida, and then I'm like, oh wait, and now they're fighting the Bullet Club. Impact announced this. This would have been cooler on the episode if, like, we or okay, they're going to wrestle Bullet Club. Cool. Impact announced this like two weeks ago, and it, it's 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 reading chapter five before you read chapter one. I know they they think okay, we're going to sell some some tickets by letting people know what matches are on a card. I totally get that thinking, but I I, I hate knowing what matches are going to happen before we actually see them on TV, you know, before we see them, the match actually made, you know, and the graphic came out, Josh Alexander got the world title. They're like, should he retain this? Shut the fuck up. Like you guys just let us know. Josh Alexander was going to win. We knew Rich Swan wasn't going to beat him, but I mean, you know, come on. So, um, so yeah, this should be cool. This should be cool. Uh, you know, I, I, I always say I don't like the bullet club, but I, I like Kenta. So, so this should be cool. This was not cool. Callahan versus Rhino. Step six. What the fuck is step six? What is step five? What was step four? They're just throwing random numbers out in this 17-step process. They're just throwing numbers out at this point. The story has completely, you know, it was, okay, we're going to make it interesting. There's a seven, you know, deadly steps, six, nine, niner. I don't know. Now it's, they're just numbers. Next, it's, next, it's going to be six A, you know, six B. They're just, they're just saying shit because there's no explanation what any of them mean. They, uh, they're reactionary. They have to do with whatever happened that episode. Oh, since you just did this then it's time for step five. Like even Sammy last week was like, what is step five? You'll find out next week. So, I mean, clearly step six had to do something with, uh, you know, these guys turning on him and costing them the match, you know, but the explanations are absolutely horrible. And this match, uh, kind of a waste of our time, to be honest with you, because this wasn't good. And then we get, we didn't get a DQ finish, but we got a fuck finish. And there was three fuck finishes on this show that I could think of. There was one clean um, clean match on this show. So a couple episodes when I said, hey, this episode sucks, lots of DQs, you know, or or lots of lots of fuck finishes. And 
it's okay to do that once an episode, you know, but it, it just seems like right now they're relying on that very, very heavily because they are afraid for people to beat people, you know, like there was no reason for Boo Pinder to lose that match. I understand he already lost the Bully Ray once. So they don't want to beat him again. Like, I know we, we, I get it. We want Boo Pinder to be one of the faces of the company. We want to get him some momentum, but he's, he's, he's ending up on his ass anyway. He's not feuding, really feuding with anyone. He's not going to have a pay per view match, I don't think. So you're doing something with him, but you're not at the same time. So just beat him. You know, you want to heat him up later because he's, it's, it's going somewhere. Then yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know. Maybe there's something. Maybe they got something. He's maybe he's gonna be a big part of this feud, you know. Maybe. So I, I guess we'll see. I, sh- I shouldn't um, jump to conclusions on it, but uh, you know, it, this was kind of a match no one really wanted to see. And then, you know, we get the end where they 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 hit Callahan with the chair, and I still don't understand why he wants to be, he's never said why he wants to join the group. And then they treat him like they're forcing him to join the group. And he's acting like they're forcing him to join the group. So this is just, this is bad folks. Um, And I, I, I I said this last week and I'm going to continue to say, I'm not going to, I'm going to save all judgments until this whole thing is done. I don't know if it's, we're going to get some kind of reformation of OVE or what. I'm going to I'm going to save judgment, but it is not looking good right now. And the fans have turned away from this, this whole story. Sammy promises this is going to be good. So let's hope it is. Uh, but but it's it's not going well so far. The design. Rhino had said uh, or on commentary, like, you know, Rhino has a deep history with this version of the design no he doesn't he has zero history with this version of the design the only one he had any history with was diener and diener was just uh you know a lackey I, excuse me i don't think the diener character is working as the leader I, I like the transition and i do think he can talk um and i don't think he should be walking to the ring with his arms hanging at his sides but it's it's something about the the fingertip thing that is that comes off a little phony because it just happened out of nowhere. You know, it's like the episode of Family Guy where he's everyone thinks he's God, so he just starts acting like God. You know, it, it, it's I'm t- talking about Peter, they think he's God, so he just starts acting like God, and there's no real justification for it. So, whatevs, it's whatevs, folks. Um, then we got. Uh, Santino and Dango, they're talking about Gregory cleaning the basement. Like someone has to explain this to me because I don't know who that is. And I I kept thinking they were going to elaborate on who it is. And then Trey Miguel comes out and they're continuing to talk about Gregory. Who is that? What, what does cleaning the basement? Where, where, how, what am I missing here? What story, what, Was this for the sake of trying to be random and try to be funny? I I have to believe I am missing something because this made absolutely no sense. Trey Miguel comes and saves the segment. And I wrote down here that there is no substitution for good lighting. This episode did not have the pink and purple lights and, and, and trying to be cute. They just had good lighting backstage. There's no substitute for that. If you ever, if you, if I, if you ever work in television or do video content, there's no substitution for good lighting. I have horrible lighting in my office here and there's nothing I can do about it. Just the way that my windows and all this shit are set up. When I move, you're going to see a different ball game. I saw so you know, but I'm not going in and just. Let's get some purple lights here. Let's get this and this. Let's let's you know mess with the you know the the color balances on my setting. You know what I mean? There's no substitution for good lighting. 
This is a great example. This looked good. It looked natural. And I don't know why they try to make things look unnatural backstage sometimes for the sake of doing it. I do know. I'm just, I know I say it quite a bit and it's very offensive to people within the company, but it's amateur behavior. I know that from my amateur days of graphics. I know my, my friends from their amateur days of video editing, amateur days of graphics. Like you think more is more, but more is, you know, less is more. But whenever you're starting off, when you're ever in that, that first stage, that first year, first couple of years, you think more is more. And that is what is going on um, with, with what they're doing backstage. And he let uh, Trey Miguel know he's going to have a handpick opponent. Um, I thought uh, <laughs> when Swinger came up and called Dango Swayze, that, that was funny. Um, he, and, it, you know, he was in his little ring. Sw Swinger brings the right amount of humor to all this. And, you know, ugh, just just this should have been the only comedy on the show. I know in the title of this, I talked about bad comedy. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to the, the the meat of this episode that had some of the worst television I have seen in the history of Impact Wrestling. Then we got Jordan Grace versus Alex Gracia. Alex Gracia has, has been on my short list of girls I wanted to see as knockouts. And, and I, I feel like I have a good eye for knockouts. Last time someone asked me, who would you like to see in a division? I said, Layla Gray. This was before she was a baddie, and now she's on AEW as a baddie. But Alex Grassi was kind of on my short list because I think she has a, a great look that Impact could use. She was not good in this match, though. It was very, very clunky. Uh, thank God it was short. And, you know, they announce her as a jobber. Um, and, and the Impact audience is always like, every time we see a jobber on the show, <laughs> we're like, si Impact, sign this person. I don't mean to call her a jobber, but you, you understand what I'm getting at. Ashley Dimbaugh, come out, si si sign her. <laughs> everyone, everyone really jumps to that. Um, they're probably not going to sign her. When she was on screen, though, I was thinking she would she would be great with Alicia Edwards. You know, she she could come in and do jobs. You know, what I mean, they could be a little job tag team, whatever. Like, but I felt like that could work. I'm sh I'm sure we're never going to see her again, though. I'm, you know, hopefully we do because again, I'm, I'm I am a fan. I don't think this was a good like representation. I I didn't think this match was very good. This match was just to plug Jordan Grace's diary. That that's all this was. Um, because she doesn't need the win. But why 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 did why did this match happen? Because it gave impact. Or, an opportunity to be like, hey, Jordan Grace Diary on YouTube. Da, 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 da. That's that's all this was. So don't think too into don't, don't think this was a showcase for you know Alex Gracia to get signed or anything like that. That's that's all this was about. Joe Hendry was backstage after this. And this this was funny. I I my sense of humor, I enjoy that like no context humor where he walks in and he's like, and I said, and I said, I'll take it to go. I thought that was so funny because we get no context behind the joke. It's like when it's like the rectum almost killed him joke. Like you just get the second half of it. So that's funny humor to me. And then, uh, you know, Moose, Moose and, and from Brian Myers come in. There's a little segment, there's a little talk in there and then they attack him. And I thought they did a really good job here of building sympathy for Joe Hendry and getting heat on Moose and Brian Myers. You know, it's like they try to do that with PCO and Eddie Edwards you know, just get heat on Eddie. But every time they get heat on Eddie, it's it feels forced and unnatural. And this was like I thought perfectly done. I thought I thought um, Heath, I mean Heath, Moose, and uh, Myers really further established themselves as heels with this. And I think it it helped us to get behind uh, Joe Hendry a little bit too. So uh, kudos to this. I thought it was pretty good. Then it shows Mickey James and um, Giselle Shaw stretching 45 minutes before their match. Um, there was a little backstage thing uh, with the Bullet Club and the Shane Hayes. So uh, my guy, Lewis from Alliance Pro Wrestling, he asked me, oh, what do you think of Shane Hayes versus Mike Bailey last week? I'm like, I didn't give a shit because I don't know who he is. I know some people do. I didn't know who he was. 
he cut a promo with Gia Miller backstage saying, I'm going to make an impact. See what I did there? And then Gia's like, yeah, you know, that was pretty, pretty clever, pretty creative. No, everybody says that. So it was just his promo, his, you know, he has a very goofy character that kind of stands out. So we'll see if he shows up more on impact, what would I think of him? But I, I didn't particularly care about the match because I'm, I'm just like, I don't know who this is. And I'm a little over the Mike Bailey having a good match thing. Like, I, I want to see something other than that. I want to see some, you know, I'm talking about Josh Alexander starting to show a little growth with his personality and promos and character. Like, that's what I want to see from Mike Bailey. Uh, just come here and do namaste and do some kicks and, and flips and have a good match. I'm just, I'm very much over that. Um, But speaking of good match, we got Kushida versus Jonathan Gresham. And this was just a good match. That's all this that's all it was. They were, you know, this was to let people know that that uh hoverboard lock is a you know a dangerous move that you'll tap tap out at any time uh, because he's getting ready to wrestle Josh Alexander for the title. He is not gonna beat Josh Alexander. It doesn't matter what they're trying to sell, what type of moves, he is not going to beat Josh Alexander because Josh Alexander is going to wrestle Steve Macklin, but they're making Josh Alexander defend the title multiple times before that, wasting good matches. I shouldn't say they're wasting good matches. Just do non-title matches. Just tell us these guys are going to wrestle, and that's it. You know? The title is not needed. Uh, You guys want to put on some good matches? Awesome. The title is not needed for them. So um, most people would say this was the best match on the show. I thought it was the second best match on the show, personally. Just because... I, I know I say this a lot. I just didn't care a whole lot. When I when I say I don't care, it, it means that there's a match and it just happens out of the blue. There's no, I'm not saying there has to be a build, but there, you know, why on the set, last week's episode of Impact, John, Jonathan Gresham not have just, I challenge Kushida next week and this is why. I want to prove myself in this. You know, these number one contendership matches are happening. I'm not involved. I'm not involved in the main event of the show. I'm not even on the show half the time. So I'm calling you out, Kashida. Now, now I care. So that's that's the difference of what I'm saying is you we're just having a good wrestling match and then giving us a reason to care about it. Because what's the stakes here? There's when there's just no stakes. And there's no, you know, pre-announcement. It's just on the fly. And it's a, it's, you know, like Tom Hannafin loves to let us know. It's a, and it's a first time matchup and it's just, here it is out of the blue, out of nowhere. That's when I don't care. But all, all it takes last week, Jonathan Gresham cutting a passionate promo. I'm challenging Kashida, and this is why. And now I care all of a sudden. You know what I mean? So. I just want to shed some light on that one because I say that a lot. I don't care. Now you know what I'm talking about. Just matches out of the fucking blue. All right. Then we get Eddie Edwards being driven out there. And I didn't care. (laughs) That was different because I just really don't care about this feud. I just don't enjoy anything of it. I want to see, I want to see PCO move on and do an angle with someone else. And I want to see Eddie Edwards move on and do an angle with someone else and hopefully improve his character in the meantime. But I think he is so stagnant right now doing this PCO thing. And I know they're probably very proud of themselves. Like this story has been brewing for like a year now. Like this is, this is so bad. Speaking of so bad, this is what made the episode because for, for the most part, a lot of what I said right now is, you know, it's some good stuff, right? Because I told you there's redeeming qualities about the show. This singular part of the show, maybe not singular because there's like back-to-back segments. This brought down the entire episode. This was so fucking bad. This was So we start off with Killer Kelly in the ring. Killer Kelly has never spoken before on the show with the exception of onesie twosie comments. She has never been sitting there with a microphone. Now, her sitting on the chair, the backward, you know, backwards on the chair, that works for her. Like if she was standing in the middle of the ring with a fucking microphone looking like Mean Gene Okerlund, she would have completely killed her entire character. 
So doing it like this, this is smart, okay? So I'm going to say that was the positive about this. You could hardly hear her. The microphone was like five feet from her mouth. And she's talking about a feud nobody fucking cares about. I did care at first. I think the potential was there because I, I do like both these knockouts. But this gimmick with Taylor Wilde is so bad. And it's it's her. It's like it's, it's really her. So you would think she's just turning up the volume. But it is bad acting. It is bad delivery. There's no explanation on it, anything. The gimmick happened out of nowhere. I don't I'm not even sure why she's beefing with Killer Kelly to begin with. Didn't she beat her? Was it in the number one's contenders match or so, or something along those lines? No, she beat Masha. Someone beat Killer Kelly recently. Oh no, she got pinned in that tag team match, the tag team title match. That's what it was. I mean, is there maybe there has been. I don't know if there's been a great explanation why um she's doing this to her. You know, why did she trick her into being a tag team with her? But Killer Kelly comes down. The crowd is dead for this, folks. The crowd is dead for it. And Kylan King comes down. Well, Kylan King that we know, for those of us who pay attention, was offered a contract by Impact, Impact and she turned it down. Um, maybe she was holding out hope for AEW. because She's done a lot of AEW work. Maybe she changed her mind. Maybe she's here for three months, month to month bullshit that everyone hates so much i don't really know but she came down and she hit killer kelly with a chair and then she picked her up so i talk a lot about impact finishers i talk about that's been like one of my big things the last couple of years these horrible fucking finishers highland king much i like i used to say about giselle shaw when she came in highland king has a good finisher she picks her up, and I'm thinking she's going to hit the finisher. And it's got a good name to it, too. I don't remember exactly, like, that Kingdom Come or some shit like that. I, I, I don't remember exactly what it is. But she picks her up and gives her, like, the John Cena move. And John Tom Hannafin's trying to sell this, like, oh, you know, like... Bro, that is one of the worst and weakest finishers... In wrestling, and I don't know if this is going to be her finisher in the company. This did not. I like if she would have just hit her normal finisher, there would have been so much more impact. But you hit her with the chair, and then you do this. This I can take that bump, and it's the crowd is dead. I'm glad to see Kylan King. I love Kylan King. I really do. I'm glad to see her. And I know she's going to be on my screen for a while. We're going to assume they're tag team champions here soon. But this is what Impact does. New knockouts tag team. Wrestle for the title the next fucking week. And maybe this is due to necessity because Ty is leaving. Should have put the belts on the Hex in my opinion. Maybe Hex only came in for that match. I I, I don't know. Because we don't see him again. So I'm, I'm going to assume that's all they were doing. I haven't asked uh, AK. I talked to her a little bit about um, about things, but I didn't ask her that in particular. But this was, this was so bad, and the crowd just didn't care. But this wasn't the worst part. Then they're backstage. Killer Kelly's sitting on a chair selling nothing. And this is the third time in the last month that they've had a segment. The other one was Dango. The other is Ashley Dembois, that they're on the screen minutes after losing and they're selling nothing. She's sitting there. The death dolls come. And the the when they had a few weeks ago, Killer Kelly, Taylor Wilde, and the death dolls all laughing and Taya looking at them all funny. I actually found that hilarious. It was so bad that it was funny. <laughs> I thought it was really funny, actually. Because it was meant to be bad. I don't know that this is meant to be bad. They're, you know, acting like, hey, we, we, we want to help you out. And Killer Kelly's like, I got this. So Killer Kelly's doing a lot of talking all of a sudden. 
And then uh, Kylan King and uh, Taylor Wild come. And they, you know, Death Dolls, like, we know what this is about. We'll give you a match for the tag team championship. Again, bring in a tag team, form a tag team, wrestle the next week for the belts. That is how this works with the knockouts tag team division. I don't remember what their, their name is. Uh, I, I wrote it down and then I'm looking on the website right now. I, they had a little tag team name. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure it'll come back to me. We're going to assume that they're, they're going to win the, the, well, they challenged them for the titles. I shouldn't say they offer the title match. They challenged them. The death dolls agree under one condition. They must stop practicing dark magic. Folks, this these back to back segments was the worst, you know, ten minutes of television they have done since. Oh my god, maybe the race for the case stuff, and that was years ago. This was so so bad, and I mean. Have we really got into the the, the weeds of Taylor Wilde's ma- her dark magic and all that? She she's busted out the tarot cards like twice on the episodes during a match. No, once during a match and then once tonight. And these are gonna be the tag team champions, I think. Kylan King just showed up tonight. What the hell does she have to do with with the dark magic? Has she ever done anything on the screen to do? <laughs> oh my god let's move on this was so bad and then we get into pco and, and a edwards and they're fighting and the pco gets hit by hit by a car so where who's who you know the coven that's their name i'm sorry the coven so who hit pco it's probably Eddie, it's probably alicia edwards People, people are hoping Eddie, uh, excuse me, Davy Richards pops up in all this. I don't see how that would fit. I don't see how that would make any logical sense. Alicia's never on TV. That's what makes logical sense that she's finally siding with her husband, maybe turning heel. This is all awful. So b- between the Death Dolls and the and the, the Coven and Killer Kelly, which I love, Killer Kelly, man, I hate throwing her in that group. Between that and the PCO and the Eddie Edwards stuff, this. That destroyed this episode because there was a lot of good good on it too. But those mixed with throwing a, a nut shot in here, there, and a DQ here, and a fuck finish there, like it, it just overall was not good. And I don't think that someone tuning in would be like, I, I'm going to watch next week. Then we got um Mickey James versus Giselle Shaw in the main event. This was good. This I love this match. I think this was great. Had a fuck finish, but which I didn't totally agree with. Like, are we going to see Deanna all of a sudden hates Giselle Shaw so much, you know, because she, she's the one that threw the chili in her face twice, the cold chili, the ice cold, uh, or the, the, the room temperature sitting out all day, chili. She's the one that did that to her. Okay. Giselle cheated and beat her. I get it. Deanna's a baby face. Now it, it this was going to happen with them getting the crowd doing virtuosa, and TW was always saying on the cool factor, hopefully we're doing the cool factor again soon. But he was always saying, like, she's a heel. Stop cheering for the heel. And this is what's going to happen. And now she's a baby face. She is, it's not the same. You know, she's saying baby face things in there, giving props to Mickey James. She should hate Mickey James. Just because she's a baby face now, Mickey James and her are cool. They're friends. Like, she should hate Mickey far worse than she ha- than she does Giselle Shaw. She would she should want Giselle Shaw to win that match because so she can wrestle to Giselle Giselle Shaw and, and beat the beat her for the title. I didn't like them giving Giselle this match so quickly because she cut this great promo last week. You beat a Giselle Shaw, not this Giselle Shaw. And then Gail Kim comes out. Well, the match is going to happen, and then Giselle's acting like she doesn't want the match, and it completely ruins everything that was just said. This uh, we're we're getting an extension of the feud between Giselle and and uh, Deanna. This is what this is all about. But I did think the match was good. They were hitting each other very hard. There were some really hard hitting um, moments here. Giselle's going to be knockouts champion one day. 
And I think it's going to be a really entertaining title run. It, it's going to happen. That That is just going to happen one day. It might not happen this year. It might happen next year. I don't know. You know? Is, is she going to get another shot for the title again versus Mickey? Is she going to get a shot? You know, is she going to beat Deanna and um, get a shot that way? Are they going to play We Own the Night for five minutes straight while they run down the New Japan card? Yes. Um, I don't know, but, uh, you know, a little bit of a fuck finish, but I, I don't think it took away from it. I really, I really like the match. When they say the knockouts are going to be in the main event, they usually really, really go at it. And Mickey James matches can be a little hit or miss for me. Um, you know, especially if he starts doing the sent on and all that crap and it doesn't look good in the MIG DT, you know, if we get a match without the MIG DT, we all win, you know, that that's, that's, um, that's a positive for all of us. If we can, if we can get a Mickey James match without that move, because it looks like my ass, um, that's it. So, uh, good, good redeeming qualities about the episode, but the bad, I thought weighed it down so much. Uh, because it was there was so much of it, like the PCO and Eddie stuff. There was three segments, and that's okay. We want I, I've said this before. We want interweaving storyline stuff that goes in and out of the show. Like we do want some of that, uh, but this was bad. It, it wasn't that bad. It just wasn't that good. But but the but the stuff with the knockouts was just awful. And and we're trying to tell people like, hey, uh, this is the best wrestling women's wrestling division in the world. Uh, Mickey James and Giselle Shaw like really saved the episode in as far as how we view the knockouts because we had so many involved in there and they were all and and it was just all so bad. All right, someone's ringing my doorbell, it's UPS. I'm your boy, BQ, folks. I'm out. Peace. <laughs>